Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Walker, Executive Director of the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to our panel discussion entitled The Menace of Unreality, How the Kremlin Weaponizes Information, Culture, and Money. This is also the title of a special report being presented today by The Interpreter, which is a project of the Institute of Modern Russia. The National Endowment for Democracy has the pleasure of hosting this event. Although the endowment hasn't been involved with the production of the report that's the basis of the discussion today, we have close ties with the organizations that are represented here and are proud to host and be associated with today's event. The report's authors, Peter Pomerantsev and Michael Weiss, have a shrewdly analytical take on a subject that cries out for deeper analysis. Their report will undoubtedly become the standard for understanding the ways in which Russia exerts influence in the 21st century context. The release of this report is especially important and timely for many reasons, apart from coinciding with the Russian government's announcement this week of its major international media expansion, which has been branded Sputnik. I'll mention just three reasons apart from this one. First, at a time when Russia appears committed to challenging and upending the international order, media have become the Kremlin's frontline weapon in pursuing this goal. Second, Russia's domestic political environment informs its behavior beyond its borders. The Russian authorities spare no effort or expense at home to control and manipulate news media. Russia is now taking their media values beyond their borders. Finally, and related to the second point, the international aspect of Russia's media and Russia's wider authoritarian diplomacy, if we can call it that, is increasingly impacting the democracies. So far, there's been a deep underappreciation by the democracies of the Russian government's aims of manipulating and corroding legitimate discourse in democratic settings. This report will help shrink the knowledge gap and should serve as the basis for a response to this growing challenge. Quick word on social media for today's discussion. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag Infowar or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the Institute of Modern Russia at In Modern Russia. And now it's a real pleasure for me to introduce the moderator of today's panel, David Kramer. David has served for the past four years of, as pre president of Freedom House. Prior to that, he was senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And before that, he served eight years in the US Department of State, including as assistant secretary for democracy, human rights, and labor. He also served as deputy assistant secretary of state for European and Eurasia affairs, and was a professional staff member in the secretary's office of policy planning. I would mention that we have David here today in one of his last public events as Freedom House president. He'll start soon, uh, very soon actually, in a new capacity at the McCain Institute where he will undoubtedly do great things. It's my pleasure to hand things over to David. Chris, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much. It's a real delight to be here at the NED where I feel like a member of the family, quite honestly. And my thanks to you and Mark and Carl and the whole team here for hosting this event. Uh, and of course, to the Institute of Modern Russia uh, for putting this event together. And to my three colleagues sitting on the panel here, I can't think of three better people to be up here uh, joining us today, particularly the two authors of the report, but also uh, Hannah, who is a, a terrific expert in her own right. You have the bios for the three, so I'm not going to go into a lengthy introduction, but what we will do is we'll start with uh, Peter, who will give an overview of the report that's just come out. We'll then turn to Michael um, for the recommendations part and Hannah for her reaction on the report and the broader problems that we're facing. Uh, Peter Pomerantsev is a British author and documentary producer. He's written for a number of prestigious uh, publications and is an outstanding expert on these issues as well as many others. He's been a consultant um, in to the European Union and World Bank projects and others. Um, so without further ado, Peter, let me turn to you and then we'll turn to Michael, who is the editor in chief of The Interpreter, um, which is founded as a news and translation service 
done by the Institute of Modern Russia, a position that he has started, uh, been there since May 2013. And then uh, Hannah is, is, uh, Hannah is a uh, Eurasian analyst at the Foreign Policy Initiative here in Washington, as well as Senior Research Assistant at the Center for the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, and uh, been a, a great colleague of mine over the years as well. Peter, over to you. Dave, thank you very much. Of course, uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, so I just just want to make a couple of summary points on some of the things that have Long flight from London. I'll just, is that better? Cool. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about the genesis of this paper, and maybe that will take us right into the theme. Um, so a while back, Michael uh, approached me with the idea of writing something about info war. This was sort of around May. Um, and info war was in the air. Suddenly everybody was talking about info war. The, uh, the um, uh, impressive Dmitry Kishilov was suddenly giving interviews saying that uh, info war is the most important type of war. Um, the, the word was in the air, and I, I assumed that I knew what the term info war meant. I thought info war is when two people from different sides shout at each other, saying, this is what I think, and this is what I think, and they kind of have a debate, and you know, that's kind of the community and the ideas of, of, of uh, you know, information that, that I'd grown up with. But then I, I started reading um, some of the Russian military thinking about what they meant as info war. And they weren't talking about debate, they weren't talking about soft power, they weren't talking about public diplomacy, persuasion, any of the vocabulary that I was familiar with. They were talking about using information essentially as a weapon to disorganize the enemy, confuse the enemy. Uh, they were talking about the resurrection of active measures and spreading disinformatia to pollute the decision-making pro uh, process in the West. They were talking about something called reflexive control, which was using information to get the other side, i.e. the West, to make decisions of their own volition, which are conducive to the Kremlin. This was a whole, I felt it sort of, I, I'd stepped through a looking glass. Instead of the message being important, it was, uh, it was, it was the mechanism and the sort of the, the underlying purpose um, of, of the Kremlin's information campaign, which actually mattered. So essentially, that what they'd taken, they'd weaponized information. And I realized that sort of as a, as a journalist, I had no analytical tools with which to analyze this. And I s we certainly didn't have any sort of institutional ways to deal with this. I mean, w I did a lot of interviews, you know, asking people, what do you think the Kremlin is up to, its information game? And they're like, well, it's doing propaganda, we do propaganda, everyone does propaganda. And I think that's one of the key kind of suggestions in our report. We've almost got to jettison this word propaganda and find a new glossary, disinformation, misinformation, confusion, to look at the different ways information is being used. Uh, and that would maybe start giving us an analytical uh, structure within which to look at what the Kremlin is doing. But the Kremlin's uh, sort of, you know, its, its, its attempts to discombobulate the West don't end with information. They also uh, include using something else we think of as very positive, culture, uh, as, as a tool of uh, military thought, essentially. So from around 2004, uh, Kremlin theoreticians and Duma members talk about setting up uh, Russian compatriots NGOs abroad in order to subvert foreign countries. Again, this strikes right to the center of sort of our idea of liberal democracy. Just as we think that having lots of information is better for liberal democracy because we have a nice debate, we think having lots of sort of different cultural institutions, churches, compatriots, organizations is good for, you know, having a nice multicultural chit chat. What do you do with an enemy or with a, uh, with a malign actor who thinks of you as an enemy who is using freedom of culture in order to subvert your society. And finally, I think an area which maybe we're more aware of, the Kremlin uses money and the idea of free trade as a weapon. Again, this gets right to the heart of liberal democratic ideas. Um, if we think of you know, globalized trade as a way of sublimating conflict into peace, as a way of overcoming policy, what do you do with an actor that uses money and trade as an instrument of a belligerent foreign policy? All this comes together in one big picture, and it's something that the Kremlin refers to as asymmetric war. And the idea behind asymmetric war is that Russia is weaker than the West. Russia could never take the West on in direct military confrontation. What are the clever forms that it can use in order to win what it sees as a new tussle? Um, and, and 
very, very, put very, very simply, the key idea is let's use the openness of the Western system against it. Yes, let's use the vulnerabilities of the Western system against it. Or actually, let's use the strengths of the Western system against it. So that's kind of the space that we look at in the paper. And we come up with lots of ideas. Maybe some of them are realistic. Maybe some of them would require too much money and government support with which to counter it. But I think the most important thing is to understand that this is a new sort of challenge. What the Kremlin is doing now, I fear, will be replicated by other um, malign state and non-state actors. Every rising authoritarian state can start using these techniques of asymmetric uh, conflict in order, to, uh, in order to pursue their foreign policy. Um, and I'll leave you with one final thought that was um, uh, told to me by a Russian media guru by the name of Vasily Gatov, who used to work at Ria Novosti before the purge there and now lives in Massachusetts. Um, I thought he summed up part of the challenge very, very beautifully. He said that uh, if in the 20th century, the great challenge was the battle against, censor against censorship for freedom of information, the great challenge in the 21st century is going to be the battle against the abuse of freedom of information in order to subvert it. Um, so with those thoughts, I'll pass them to my board. Thank you, Peter. Um, so the way I sort of approach the, this, this notion of Russian, or I should say Kremlin, disinformation and propaganda is also as a journalist. I mean, that, that's what I do for a living. And, and one of the frustrations I had in, in thinking up this report and, and how to approach it is, why is it that Putin succeeds so well in kind of uh, hoodwinking the West, convincing the West that his motives are X when in fact they're Y? And one of the conclusions I think we came up with was that actually, as Peter said, he is very adept at seconding the openness and the transparency of the Western system, particularly the Western news uh, cycle or the Western media outlets, to, to um, you know, essentially become accomplices in his information warfare. Uh, to give you examples of this, when the Russian foreign ministry puts out a claim, a claim which can be about the use of chemical weapons in Syria, who downed MH17, he knows, Putin knows, and his, his minions understand that the, you know, the BBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post, they are duty bound to report, quote, both sides of the story. So they end up giving equal weight to what the Russian Foreign Ministry says as to what the State, US State Department says. The problem is some things that are prima facie absurdities or just flat out lies, real whole cloth you know, examples of dis disinformation, end up becoming the headlines in these stories. To give you an example, after the Ghouta chemical attack in uh, 2013, one of the first responses that the Russian Foreign Ministry said was, aha, this whole thing was staged and we can prove it. Alexander Lukashevich, who's the Foreign uh, Ministry spokesman, said that the YouTube video showing the first alleged victims of the Ghouta chemical atrocity was uploaded before the attack took place. Now the thing to understand about this is, um, YouTube uploads at California time, not Damascus time. But I swear to God, I mean, this was picked up by major Western news organizations and run. Russian Foreign Ministry says Guta attack was staged. The real story there is the Russian Foreign Ministry doesn't know that the Earth goes round the sun on a daily basis, right? But this is, this, is the, this is the job of some lazy editor or some lazy journalist not being able to just do, without any specialist knowledge of KGB active measures or disinformation, not being able to do their job. So one of the things that we do in the, in the report in the recommendation section is to give ways that, that the Western media can actually exercise a little more restraint or discipline. Um, when you have a source in media, and that source does nothing but lie to you, guess what? He no longer becomes a credible source. But when you're dealing at the level of government, again, you have a, a difficulty here, because what the Russian state says is important. People need to understand these things. But you can learn some tricks of the trade. So recall the, the episode with the first white so-called humanitarian convoy that was being sent to Ukraine. This was a classic example, a classic example of the Kremlin essentially using the Western news cycle against its own interests or against US interests. How, how do I mean? Well, from the state on down in, in Russia, the instruction was simple. Focus exclusively on the convoy. What's in the trucks? Where are the trucks going? Why is Ukraine, the fascist junta of Ukraine, obstructing the importation of diapers and food and medicine for the beleaguered people in the Donbass? Every Western journalist descended on the, that convoy of trucks. The BBC, the Telegraph, the Guardian, everybody. Um, fortunately, you know, this operation I would count a failure. What, what it was designed to do was to misdirect, right? Look over here, but don't look over there. Because while you're wondering what's in the trucks, we're actually sending tanks and armored personnel carriers and books and weapons across the border into Ukraine. And it was only by happenstance, you know, the Guardian and the Telegraph actually had people who saw, who witnessed 
you know, this kind of masquerade unfold, that we, we were able to kind of call time on it. But this is a very cleverly cooked up kind of provocation, right? Um, what we say for the media, I mean, you know, in a sense, this is relearning some of the epistemology of the Cold War, some of the tactics that, that the, the Czechists have used, some of the tactics that, you know, sort of Russian diplomatic corps uh, personnel have used, but adapting it for the 21st century. So one of the things we, we suggest is actually having a disinformation ombudsman in major news organizations who can say, this we know to be flat out false, or this we know to be a lie. And we have to frame it editorially in such a way that our readers are not going to be psychologically sort of duped. Because eventually what happens is the, the, the more doubt, the more skepticism, the more kind of um, you know, sand you throw in the air, eventually this does actually change Western perceptions of what happened. Conspiracy theories, that, I mean, this is the stock and trade. This is the damp clay that the Kremlin is quite adroit at molding to its purposes. These people that exist in nature, people who believe the CIA invented the AIDS virus itself, a KGB active measure that was planted in, I think, the 70s or 80s. It's in the report. The CIA assassinated John F. Kennedy. It's an extraordinary thing, right? This made it into Oliver Stone's JFK film. Nobody who probably has seen that movie understands that this was cooked up in Moscow Center planted in an Italian newspaper, and that newspaper was sent to the Dallas prosecutor's office, and suddenly there's this conspiracy theory that the U.S. government was responsible for the murder of the president. The problem is, in the 21st century, with online media, you know, it's not that truth and fact are being disseminated at a, a faster pace, it's that information is. And so active measures have become mediated. Okay, what could have been a, a, a week-long or month-long or year-long provocation uh, by the counterintelligence or KGB uh, apparatuses in the 70s and 80s, now takes literally about 15 minutes. Some guy living in his mom's basement who writes for Russia Today, who's paid maybe $50 per article, puts up a story saying that the CIA has weaponized the Ebola virus for use as a biological weapon, which, by the way, RT did in its Spanish language media, and it was then translated into English. This takes 15 minutes to do, and you push publish, and suddenly it goes viral. Because even if people don't believe it, they still are talking about it, right? The goal of Kremlin uh, propaganda or disinformation is not necessarily to convince people that their narrative or their version, their account of, of events is true. It's to distract them. It's to confuse them, right? Look over there, but don't look over here. Another thing, frankly, I think that, that, that media should be more duty-bound to uh, enforce is editorial transparency. Right? I read any number art of articles per on a daily basis, op-eds and major broadsheets like the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, written by people either with vested financial interests in Russia who are telling us what should be done about Ukraine, typically Finlandization or some kind of settlement with Putin or some kind of neutrality agreement that the Ukrainian people don't necessarily want. I've also read articles, frankly, in, in these broadsheets that are written by former Russian military intelligence officers. And in their byline or in their skirt, they're identified as people who work for prominent Western think tanks or prominent Russian think tanks. Let me ask you a question. If tomorrow Leon Panetta wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about what should be done about Ukraine, and in the skirt it said, Mr. Panetta is a prominent walnut farmer from California, <laughs> would somebody from the Times be fired? I suspect that they would be. And again, this information is open source. You know, I don't have access to, to you know, who are former Czechists from, from Russia who are now doing this stuff. It's out there. It's publicly available. So again, the self-enforcement of editorial guidelines and journalistic standards, I think, is key. Rhetoric, language, that is another tool that Putin has used and co-opted. And there, there are w everybody in this room, I guarantee you, inc myself and Peter included, are guilty of essentially regurgitating foreign ministry talking points without even knowing that we're doing it. Okay? I'll give you one example. Um, there's a State Department official who told me that uh, he went to, the new to a, a major Western news publication and said, why do you keep referring to pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine? Most of these guys are Russian military, regular or ir irregular, GRU officers, FSB. Why do you say pro-Russian separatists? This makes it seem like there's a spontaneous revolution occurring in Ukraine, led and, and commanded by Ukrainians. And the response was, well, if the U.S. government doesn't call them Russians, uh, why am I obligated to, to use any other kind of you know, lexical invention? U.S. policy, I would submit to you, has been very, very confused, very contradictory, very ambiguous in terms of what its strategy is toward Russia. Let me ask some simple questions. I'm sure nobody in this room has coherent answers to them because God knows I don't. Is Russia a partner or is it an adversary? Are we at war in another state of Cold War with Russia or is this some kind of you know, hybridized pseudo-conflict that we are looking for an off-ramp to de-escalate tomorrow and then, I mean, you know, is Russia helping us with Iran's nuclear program? 
You know, is Russia subverting all of the, the supposed dividends of the reset? Is integrating Russia into the global financial system through the accession to the World Trade Organization a good thing? Or is it actually increasing that one export that, that Putin has besides oil, which is corruption and racketeering? I mean, if our State Department refers to Russia as a virtual mafia state, and our journalists do not treat it as such, or do not bother to do the investigation that might actually corroborate that claim, we have a fundamental problem. And I, I would submit to you this. Instead of worrying about things like, did Putin put the shawl on the Chinese leader's wife, and what does this mean, and is Obama chewing gum when he should be acting with more solemnity in Asia? Wh what, are the, what is the real story here? Okay, the first suite of sanctions that were passed on Russia, excuse me, on, on, on the Putin regime, uh, after the annexation of Crimea, to my mind, the real impact here was not the, the deleterious effect this would have on the Russian economy. It was a disclosure made by the U.S. Treasury Department, and it was sort of smuggled in there, but it was a huge one, and let me tell you why. The disclosure was that Vladimir Putin has assets in a Swiss commodities trader called Gunvor and may have, quote, direct access to cash. Now, this establishes a few things. Number one, Putin has money invested in Europe, while at the same time he is running a a feverish anti-Western and anti-American campaign, right? I mean, this is sort of Russia is the great bulwark against Western hegemony. Number two, um, why are journalists not focusing on Putin as the supposed richest man in Europe when everybody knows, and this is the sort of going rumor? This is a huge story. The New York Times several weeks ago had a great piece, an investigative journalistic piece on uh, Bank Rosia and the sort of the, the, the oligarchic uh, inner circle of the Kremlin and where, where the money is and how it works and how it Wa washes through the, the global financial system. This, to my mind, is a huge story. And yet, journalists are not being incentivized, they're not being told to go out and report it. So one of the things that can be done, one of the reasons, I should say, that, that they're not being incentivized to do it is the, the, the cost-benefit ratio is, is completely disproportionate. The chances of being sued by a Russian oligarch with billions of dollars, if you go out and you report on this stuff, is enormous. So one of the recommendations we have, and this is where civil society can sort of take up the cudgel, is to create a libel action defense fund for journalists. Okay? If you did that, then tomorrow it would be a lot easier for even online digital media groups like BuzzFeed or uh, uh, Medium or Mashable to dispatch people to offshore jurisdictions like the Bahamas, the British Virgin Islands, Cyprus, to bang on doors, to talk to these registrar companies, which are registering offshore r companies uh, you know, and, 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 and bank accounts, in the names of sort of phantom nominee directors, but they're really, they're stashing assets and cash belonging to oligarchs. And chances are these oligarchs have real estate in London or Paris. Chances are they send their kids to Eton or Oxford or Cambridge. Chances are they're actually front men for people working inside the government, okay? Again, if you want to sort of change the nature of the debate we're having about Russia, refocus on the things that, are, that is important. Uh, Russia's GDP, according to an independent monitor, one-third of its GDP is frittered away annually through bribery. That's a huge story. Transparency International ranks Russia as on par with Nigeria in terms of its transparency. So if it's exporting this kind of racketeering, if it's exporting this sort of mafia tactics and it's trying to control, like, like a capo de regime would control a mob, I mean, what, what are the tools that can be brought against it? Well, in terms of policy, you need something approaching RICO for a state government. Right? But in terms of journalism and you know, muckraking reporters who will go out and actually report on these stories. So in, in the report, you'll see kind of a, a list of recommendations. Most of them are intended not for non-governmental officials. But then again, when the U.S. government has alighted upon a coherent set of policies, or, or a, I should say a policy objective with respect to Russia, then I think you're going to see some changes in, in the way that Russia is being reported. Because government can work cheek by jowl with journalists. It can leak information and it can start to push back and be a little more aggressive. It, you know, the, 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 the goal is not to always be on the back foot and defensive. You know, everyone's worried about, oh, the Kremlin has this army of trolls. They pay $800 to people to sort of tweet nasty things at Victoria Newland or our ambassador in Ukraine, and what should we do about it? The answer is nothing. That's not the priority. That's another way to distract you, to keep you from doing your work. So I think you know, one takeaway from our report, I, I should hope, if, if, if people agree with our assessment and our recommendations, is you know, the nature of how we think about engaging with Putin, or how we deal, think about sort of confronting uh, his misbehavior, has to be completely sort of rejiggered. It, it's not about sort of a, an opportunistic you know, step by step, how can we get him not to invade Maria Pol tomorrow? It's how can we actually educate people as to what the nature of this regime is, and what it is, what motivates them and how to get them to sort of stop. Um, so at that, I think I should turn it over to Hannah, and you can pick up, disagree. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm not going to disagree. Uh, but what I do want to, and first my thanks to the NED, to IMR, to the forum uh, for holding this event and for, for allowing me to participate. But I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the, the title, actually. Right? How the Kremlin Weaponizes Information, Culture, and Money. What does Russia export? It exports right now information in the form of Sputnik or in the form of Russia Today, RT. It is exporting money, you could say. We would call it cor corruption through all right. of the bribery. But culture, that to me actually seems like the biggest um, thing that we haven't really taken a good look at. At the end of the day, there is in the West, in the United States, there is a market for this propaganda. People are consuming it because they seem to, to want to consume it, because there seems to be a kind of desire for the other, for something else, for something that's unknown. And I think Putin has figured this out. And in my mind, he knows that the West, and, and particularly in my mind, Europe, wants two things. They want leaders, strong leaders and leadership, and they want values. And you look around the world, there seems to be a lack of leadership, of people who will really stand up and have the kind of machismo that Putin puts out there. And it's something that to a lot of people who live in a sort of uh, emasculated society where they don't stand for anything anymore, at least Putin stands for something. It's attractive to a certain class, to a certain group of people. And on the values, I would posit that I'm not sure Europe knows what it stands for anymore. It has questions as to what it actually is, what it believes, and what it's fighting for. 25 years ago, Europe knew what it wanted. It was to fight for a Europe whole, free, and at peace. And now that they have that, there seems to be something lacking. And if you compare the two side by side, compare the vision that Russia is putting out, Russia is saying, look, we have leadership, we have strength, we're willing to stand for what we believe in. You may not agree with that, but at the end of the day, we want Ukraine and we're going to take it. And there is a certain kind of appeal to that. But to me, one of the things that we need to do is actually sit down and actually ask ourselves what we want, to come up with a goal. Putin has a goal. I think it's a terrible one. I think it's going to damage a lot of people. But he does have one. And we don't. We need to figure out exactly what that goal is. We've allowed a kind of vacuum in the cultural space to appear. And I think Putin and his media machine are very happy to fill it and then use it against us using all of the tools uh, that Michael and Peter just laid out. And I would also posit that there's, there's one more word, a definition that I think you'll never see used very often in, in uh, the space of propaganda, but it's glamour. Glamour is what you can't have. It's the grass is always greener on the other side. You hear the word glamour and you may think of Sophia Loren, you may think of uh, a nice ski chalet in Aspen. Uh, but those, we, we are attracted to those things because we can't have them, because they're something that is unfamiliar to us. It's the desire for the unknown, for what you don't have. And Putin has become very adept at that, I think, first through his experience in creating the internal Russian media, the domestic Russian media, where he has very cleverly, with the help of uh, Mr. Serkov uh, and other people in, his, uh, in a, his arena, have become very, very successful at casting shadows where there need to be shadows and creating mystery and allowing Putin to be anything to everyone. He is and has made himself, in the eye of the Russian public, the one person upon whom all Russians can cast their hopes and their dreams. That's why you see him go out as soon as he thinks, oh, you know, Russians want to see a strong leader. He goes out and he shoots a tiger. Uh, oh, you know, Russians want to see that someone's sensitive and he'll have a sit down and read a bunch of stories to small children in an orphanage somewhere. He gives them what they want while still maintaining this sort of aura of secrecy, this aura of, of greatness. It's what we don't know, yet it's very attractive. And I think he's now gotten to the point where those skills have worked so well, really, on a domestic level, that they're beginning to push them out internationally. 
if you watch Russia today, you're not going to see stories about an impoverished village in Siberia. Not going to happen. What, what you will see is a story about a poor town in Iowa who may have lost the jo some jobs back in 2008 and hasn't recovered yet. It's about showing you the flaws in your own life and not revealing the flaws in, in the vision that is portrayed. And to go back to, to what I said earlier about how there is no vision, if, if you are visionless, if you don't have something to grasp onto, be that religion, be it values, be it uh, politics, if everything, if there's nothing to fight for, nothing to move towards, when someone offers you another option, whether you agree with it or not, that's not the point. You don't have to agree with it, you just have to watch it. It becomes very attractive, and, and that's where I think Putin and, and the Kremlin have made incredible uh, inroads into the way we think, into the way we report the news, into how we make our business decisions. Um, it is, in a perverse and sort of very subversive way, glamour, and I'll leave it there. I'm going to um, get the conversation going and then bring in the audience here, uh, but I'm going to start with a few questions to you. Um, the first is, is this in a way trying to put lipstick on a pig, which is to say that despite what you were saying, Hannah, that Putin is projecting this uh, strength and power and assertiveness and glamour, Nevertheless, what they're dealing with and working with is kind of a lot of crap. Yeah, um, it is. So does that matter? Does that make a difference? D or I is it a way to deflect from their own internal problems? I would say it doesn't matter. Really? Um, it's all about the image you're projecting. It doesn't, they don't have to see the reality. It just has to be, we're, we're, we're showing a movie. We're telling a story. It doesn't have to be real. None of it has to be real. I think, Peter, you, you've yeah, written yeah, some uh, things uh, about this. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things. I, th I think a lot of the, um, if we're just talking about information, I, I think a lot of it doesn't fall into, into usual PR. Uh, I think we're actually no. doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go back to Hannah's point, but, but what I find most alarming, um, I don't mind Russia Today's programs about poor town in Iowa. I think this is all part of a, you know, a PR sort of narrative game. I think we can win that very easily. I think as much more subversive as the use of freedom of information for disinformation. It's not an information war, it's a war on information. It's an attempt to make the very idea of a debate impossible. So that, you re it really doesn't matter whether you're a pig, you have lipstick, or you're a butterfly. It's, it's not about that. It's, it's, it, the goals are completely different. It's not from the PR department of the Kremlin. It's not from the communications department. We have to move the conversation across the road. This is coming from the military and secret service department. This is a completely different conversation. But coming back to the PR conversation, because that is happening as well, Look, around 2008, the Kremlin realizes it's not going to be love. Apart from in Italy and then in Hungary, there, there are some there places. Are. They can do different messages in different places. But in terms of the image, it's not about being loved, it's about being feared. So it's all about looking big and strong. It's about, I mean, what, why, no one really listens to sort of Russia today here, but just the fact that Russia has it, that has this huge channel and all these thousands of trolls, it's meant to strike some sort of confusion and fear, like, hey, who are these guys? They, they look pretty powerful. Um, so a lot of it is about looking strong and fear rather than being loved. So y it's not about putting lipstick on the pig, it's putting fangs on, on the pig. It's a killer <laughs> pig. <laughs> a killer pig. Yeah. Right, that is a useful phrase to have. Uh, before, Michael, you jump in, but let me just say, Peter, um, I was um, at the OSE Human Dimension Conference in September in Warsaw, and RT was all over the place, including with a very controversial and provocative display of a journalist who was killed. Um, and it was the sole focus of this display right as you walked into the meeting. Um, is it so easy to dismiss the way you just did? Okay, so listen, um, different, the cleverness of the Kremlin is that it has a different approach for different places and its aim is always to divide and conquer. It's very detailed. So what's going to, RT is going to open in France, where it's, I assume it's going to be Jean-Marie Le Pen's private channel. If they can change public opinion through that, that's very dangerous. RT is not going to change public opinion in the United Kingdom, I mean, not even vaguely. Quite the opposite, my sense, is they're trying something that uh, is called a double bind uh, in Britain. 
So double bind is when you put the opposition into a conflicting situation where either choice is wrong and they go mad. It's actually meant to be one of the causes of schizophrenia as well. But usually it's used as a way of control without, being, without overtly trying to do anything. So what they seem to have done in Britain is uh, um, they have, uh, you know, they have shown programming which I'm pretty sure they must have at least suspected would get them in trouble with the British regulator. And like the US, we have fairly strict regulations about due impartiality and, um, and accuracy. So surprise, surprise, a couple of days ago, the British regulator, Ofcom, brought out its first report about uh, RT's programming over Ukraine. So this is just looking at their March stuff. And it's already said one more thing, and you're going to get sanctions. The, other, the next thing must be coming, because they haven't even touched their stuff about Donbass. The thing is, and this is the big problem, my sense is that RT might be looking for exactly this, because for several weeks, way before this came out, they said, if they take us off air, find us online. Immediately, they have people tweeting, ah, oh, there's no democracy in Britain. It's almost as if they were wanted this. It's almost as if they were provoking the British into this situation. The British are in complete double bind. If they ban them, it's much bigger PR victory for RT than any programming that RT could have shown, which no one watches. If they don't ban them, it subverts our whole idea of having a regulatory field. What's the point of having it if we don't enforce it? Each choice is awful. And this is a classic Cheka thing, you know. Let's put them in the uh, levilka, the fork, the double bind. Same thing, I mean, we, you see it done in the Donbass very easily. If the Ukrainians don't advance, then the, you know, the, the Russians will take more. If the Ukrainians do advance, they end up killing innocent human beings. Both choices are awful. So they love doing that. So in Serbia, in France, in Germany, which is the key swing state where there is a public opinion that likes Russia, I think RT could actually have an influence of public opinion. In Britain and America, I think the game is slightly different. You want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, you know, the tendency, because we're all sort of sensationalistically minded, we seize upon the, the most extreme or hyperbolic instances of, as you put it, crap. Um, you know, <laughs> RT... So articulately. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, yeah. you know, R uh, RT has a, has a presenter or a correspondent, I, f I forget which, who, who thinks that the Pope is a space alien, <laughs> literally. I mean, um, RT's uh, uh, Middle East expert from Germany is himself a registered neo-Nazi. Um, you know, things like that. It's, it's great, you know. I mean, I, I, I worked in... Uh, Peter has a, a background in television. Um, I, I lived in the UK, and one of the things that the BBC liked to do is they love to put, like, fire-breathing jihadist clerics on the air. And I would ask them sometimes, why are you doing that? And they said, oh, mate, it makes great telly. You know, the ratings go up and up and up and up. The same thing with putting conspiracy theorists about MH17 on the air, which they have done, by the way. Um, but I think what we're missing here, and, and, and um, this is in the report, too, and it's, it's I think, one of Peter's great insights, th th there is a, a kind of overarching theme or a leitmotif to what all of this is designed to do. And that is to say, look, we know there's no such thing as democracy. We know there's no such thing as human rights. We know there's no such thing as open society and transparency. Everyone's on the take. Liberalism is pants. I can buy anybody. And to prove it, here, Herr Schroeder, you're going to be on the board of Gazprom. Putin uses the Western vices and shortcomings as much as the strengths against itself. And he, ex I mean, you know, has there been a country in the European Union where there hasn't been a major corruption scandal? The answer is no, actually. And we, we all think about Italy, again, because it's, you know, we, we love the sort of the, the, the camp and the hyperbole of, of a Berlusconi, but this has happened across the board. To Putin, this is sort of grist for the mill. Aha. Uh -huh. Everything they say they stand for, all those principles, they're all lies. It's all bogus. So therefore, how dare they assail us for doing nakedly that which they only do, uh, you know, clandestinely? Um, and, and to, you know, th this idea, sorry, I'll give, give you a second, um, you know, moral relativism, whataboutism, which is a classic sort of Cold War piece of tradecraft. If you say, well, you invaded and annexed Crimea, they'd say, well, you went into Iraq. Or what, what do you expect? What do you, or what do you expect after Kosovo? And again, look, uh, I can show you examples of U.S. policy intellectuals saying the same thing. Now, maybe they genuinely believe it, but every time they put out th this argument, they are essentially doing Lavrov's work for him. Um, so, but again, I, I, I keep coming back to money um, because this is the one area where this sort of, you know, the Russell Brand moral universe of competitive narratives and there is no truth and everything is sort of subjective, that's where it falls apart. Because when you start seizing people's bank accounts or showing how somebody who makes $30,000 a year publicly, officially, can afford to build himself a $100 million dacha, suddenly there is such a thing as empirical fact and truth. And it does sort of set the cat among the pigeons in, inside Russia. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of crap, but then there's this kind of 
you know, what is the theme? What is the thesis that's being sold? And I think that actually is quite powerful. Yeah. RT sometimes strikes strikes me as one huge hum humanitarian convoy. Uh, <laughs> with two sitting here, I mean, in Britain, for example, everyone's talking about RT. That's not how Russia is doing influence in Britain. It's doing it via Gazprom turning up at meetings in Canary Wharf in the city of London and going, Ukraine's a failed state. Why don't we do business together? You know, that's, that's where the real influence is happening. In Britain, they've worked out that our, both our strength and our vulnerability is the city of London and our addiction um, uh, to having sort of inflows of foreign cash. That's where the real influence is happening. RT is the thing like, don't talk about this, don't talk about this. Every time we have a conversation about it in Britain, I'm like, hey, we're missing the point. In America, where they have much less uh, financial influence, my sense is they've targeted the uh, people sitting in this room, the experts in the industry. That's really been the main operation. And here we're into something, my favorite bits of uh, Russian information theory, reflective control. So a friend of mine, shall be named, um, turns up in Moscow, key expert in the think tank community, works both sides of the Atlantic, turns up. He's got really high level sources in Moscow. He's always had them. He's written a couple of grandstanding books. He lands in a meeting with Alexei Putin. He's gone mad. Putin's gone quite, quite mad. Everyone he meets, everyone who's the insider, you know, all the liberals in the Kremlin, they're all saying he's gone quite, quite mad. Don't do sanctions, they'll make him even more mad. <laughs> right. He comes back, he starts organizing a conference, how to avert a new Cold War, don't do sanctions. Halfway through, he's like, hold on, I just spent this fun. Because they do this all the time. They're comp always doing this thing they call reflective control, uh, giving us information in order to make ch change our own behavior in a certain way. So, so they have, again, look, RT in America, absolutely no influence. Influence in the expert community in Washington, rather huge, I'm afraid. Let me, but let me ask you about some of the immediate neighbors of Russia. How should they be responding to this? You, you've had Estonia make a concerted decision not to ban any broadcasting or internet uh, sites uh, coming from Russia, even though they might be aimed to... It's a decoy. Uh, <laughs> it's a decoy. It's a decoy. Kremlin circles is in the building. Do not move. Um, uh, oh, uh, so Estonia. Uh, but then you have Ukraine, which has decided to block uh, some sites, some, yeah. some networks, journalists' access. Is there, should there be distinctions made depending on the situation? Ukraine, obviously, is by Russia, is at war with Russia. It's not a civil war, it's a war with Russia. Um, so does Ukraine get some special dispensation because of that situation? Yeah, I mean, you know, so here we have the First Amendment, and the idea of pulling the plug on RT is, is unfathomable. Uh, in the UK, as Peter mentioned, Ofcom, which is the press regulatory body, is now faced with this kind of, you know, Hobson's choice. Do we enforce our own regulatory code and yank them off the air, thereby making them a martyr of freedom of speech? Or do we not do it, thereby allowing them to continue to put out all these lies and propaganda? I think, look, you know, each country has its own sort of laws, its own sort of social norms and, and such. With respect to Ukraine, um, you know, look, if, if their fear is, well, we're, we, we don't want to allow in, you know, journalists uh, from, say, Life News, which is known to be quite close to the Russian security services. Well, we don't see them as journalists. We see them as Russian intelligence officers. That is a fair argument to make. Now, I'm not advocating what Ukraine should do, but, you know, yeah, they, they, they have wartime emergency measures in place. So even Noam Chomsky, <laughs> even Noam Chomsky says that during a war, I'm talking about the Second World War, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta start doing a bit of censorship. Even, I mean, if Noam Chomsky said it, maybe the Ukrainians are allowed a little <laughs> bit of leverage, yeah. a little bit of leverage, but not too much, because we, we all know the dangers, and Ukraine might, uh, this might, we all know the dangers and, and, and the follow-on. Um, I just got back from Latvia and Estonia, and um, you know, I was very alarmed, and I was mainly alarmed by something they kept on telling me. Uh, which I think maybe people in this room appreciate, but maybe the general public in America and Britain don't understand. Look, Putin doesn't get up in the morning and have a political erection from the idea of sending tanks into Tarlet. The whole point of the Baltics, whether it's to undermine Article 5 or to like sort of just subvert them, is to make the White House look bad. This is being used as an information game, as a mirror to embarrass Washington. Because if you can prove that Article 5 is a joke, if you can prove that the 1991 transition was a joke, if you, you basically pull the rug out of the whole edifice of America's reputation. So it's not about the Baltics. The Baltics will take a million and one measures, military, secret service, and so on to defend themselves. This is about Washington. They are using the Baltics to get at you. And I suppose some people in the State yeah. Department understand that. 
I'm not sure the American public understands that. No. I think it's the regional problem. The American public doesn't even understand the exertions of hard power that are being used on a daily basis. I mean, I just read a report before coming here. Um, Russia has practiced firing cruise missiles into New York, Washington, Chicago as recently as a few months ago. It came, I think, 50 miles from the California coast, which is the closest it's ever come since the end of the Cold War. Uh, there was a near mid-air collision uh, between, I think it was a Swedish commercial airliner and a Russian fighter jet that had turned off its transponder, and it was only by the dexterity of the Swedish pilot that, that another MH17 hadn't occurred. How many people in this room know these things? How, how, much, how many of the, of the you know, people in the American uh, general public or the European general public know these things? Well, then you have the kidnapping of the Estonian security yeah. officer from Estonian territory. Absolutely. He's still sitting in the Lubyanka. And I mean, look, I think cyber I attacks and, and, and yeah, all sorts Putin, of other Putin has, right. a lot of, had a, has a lot of vulnerabilities I think we're not really appreciating. I mean, you know, um, Belarus, I mean, Europe's last dictatorship under Lukashenko. Lukashenko is pissing himself in terror, thinking that actually Putin might do to him what he's done to As Ukraine. As are the Cossacks. As are the Cossacks, Cossacks right? right? So, you know, the idea that there's this sort of monolithic bloc and that the, the so-called customs union or the Eurasian union is, is you know, everyone to a man a Putinist, I think that's a misconception. I think there are, there are weaknesses that can be exploited. Um, but again, it, it, you, you need to start with a premise. You need to start with a policy. And, you know, one of the Russians do very well, or I should say, again, you know, state agents and, and Czechists do very well, what's known as Menogahodovka, you know, multiple moves at once to discombobulate your enemy. We don't do that. We're very sort of linear in our thinking. And, you know, U.S. government can be, can, it, it takes decades, and we learn to do one thing really, really well. So in the Cold War, we, we did containment really, really well. It took a while, but we got there. And then the Berlin Wall came down, and we're like, okay, right, that's it. Russia's um, no problem. It's a regional nuisance now. Um, so let's go learn how to kill jihadis really, really well. And suddenly people are saying, well, gee, how do we deal with this? I mean, you know, I've, th we have friends in this room who are real old Cold War hands who can spot a Czechist a mile away. They can read Russian state propaganda stuff that's been put out in the state press and say, aha, I've managed to spot a certain pattern here, and this is a sign that, you know, this is telegraphing what the next move is, or this is some kind of insight into Kremlinology. Now, look, some of that may be alchemy, but some of it's actually quite useful. I mean, at the interpreter, you know, we have Paul Goebel writing for us, who's a great Cold War hand who understands this stuff very well, particularly the minorities issue, you know, what's happening in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. These people exist. We're just not relying on their expertise anymore. Coming back, could you keep on coming back to the question of policy? Because it really does, it does come back to that. What is, what is the policy towards Russia? I mean, coming back to my example of the Baltics. So, if, I mean, this is a case of putting the Americans into a double bind. Because if you say, oh my God, there's a new Cold War on that plays right into Putin's hands because that's exactly the narrative he wants to, he wants to evoke. At the same time, you say there's nothing going on, Russia is irrelevant, you're also playing into his hands because he can further bully the near abroad. So again, it's almost as if we have to start reframing the conversation about Russia. Um, get out of the stupid binary that we're in. Cold War or nothing, that's kind of where we're at. They're both stupid, they're both wrong. These are specifically 21st century challenges. I mean, one way of looking at Russia, it's not the way, is as a sort of a, a sort of a, um, uh, an agent of a malign globalization. You know, they're, they're, they're giving sort of a dark globalization um, um, as opposed to sort of the liberal democratic vision. So we really have to find a new language within which to, to, to put Russia in. Because I, I, I feel uncomfortable with some of this Cold War talk as I, well. I, I, don't feel, think it's I right. feel very uncomfortable with the, the Cold War talk. We're dealing, we, we see the enemy as the same person, but the, the reality on the ground is entirely and completely different. We're not fighting the same fight, and they're not fighting the same fight, more importantly. Mm. Let me play devil's advocate for a minute. Um, you guys, I am making far too much of this. Our stakes with Russia are too important to get caught up in this information warfare. Um, we've got the nuclear issue, we've got Iran, uh, counterterrorism, all these things. Uh, it's unfortunate what's happening in Ukraine, but there are bigger stakes out there. I would have to respectfully disagree. <laughs> I wouldn't even say respectfully. But anyway, no, I, I would disagree quite disrespectfully, in fact. <laughs> um, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Take I'm, I'm trying to be on my best behavior here, Peter. <laughs> trying. In my, to my mind, at the end of the day, and again, apologies if I do upset some of you, whether or not the Israeli-Palestinian conflict gets solved is at the end of the day not terribly important to the world order. Whether or not Russia destroys what was set up after 1945 in Europe is. And to me, that's the end of the story. Um, 
here's a question. I, if, if you can answer this, then you know, to my satisfaction, I might, might be inclined to agree. How does Putinism end? What is the culmination point? How does this regime either transfer peaceably into something else, or to you know, the, the person in charge of it? How does he leave power? My fear, my belief, is this is going to end quite messily with blood on the streets of Moscow. So if that happens, then you're going to have a failed state in possession of nuclear weapons with a colossal military, one that's growing all the time, at a rate of expansion that Western militaries simply are not growing at. Um, so therefore, yes, this is a long-term strategic problem. And we do have to start treating Russia as, as a geopolitical menace, um, which, I mean, I, this is where actually Peter and I do disagree a little bit, because I, I appreciate his points about 21st century information, weaponization of information and all that, but they are still using 20th century tradecraft mm. and tactics. I mean. Uh, President Especially Ilvis of Estonia. 19th century, I'd say. 20th century. The 20th century has plenty of examples. You know, one can say. The Estonians do something quite well, which nobody else in Europe does nearly as well, and I don't think even the United States really does as well, which is counterintelligence. Classic counterintelligence. Yeah. Estonia is chock a block full of Russian spies. So every year they put out this annual review, their the CAPO, their, their domestic security services. And they basically say, these are the people we know who are agents of influence on the Kremlin payroll, we can establish that the money come for their gongos, governmental, non-governmental organization, which invariably accuse Estonia of being a Nazi state or persecuting an ethnic Russian minority population or the Russian-speaking population, that the money comes from some state cultural agency run by the foreign ministry. So essentially, they're, they're, they're sort of giving you a list of people that they know they're aware of. And every year, invariably, they, they capture a Russian spy, somebody who's in their police force or the defense ministry or, God forbid, in NATO, and they put them on trial, and they out, they name and shame. Um, we're not doing that. And, and President Hilfus likes to joke, in Brussels, there's like three people running counterintelligence for the entirety of the European Union. Do you want to guess how many Russian spies are running around Brussels, hoovering up information on contracts that are being signed by Germany, Poland, you know, all the countries in the EU? I mean, we do have to return, I think, to a little bit of 20th, 20th century tradecraft. I think we, we, we neglect this, or we think, oh, well, we're, we're past that point at our peril. I, I, um, I think we have to look at this question of Russia's relevance. What is, the na what is the point of asymmetric war? The idea of asymmetric war is to find the, the biggest sort of uh, um, vulnerabilities, the, sort of the, the crevasses within the Western system, and catalyze and increase them. It's not a quite conversation about Russia. They're looking at our weaknesses. Uh, but these aren't, these aren't kind of minor weaknesses. These are the structural pillars, the cracks in the structural pillars of our society. So, corruption, the weaponization of money. Uh, if you can climb within globalization, and as the Russians like to say, rashatovati, to shake it from inside, you were in a very dangerous place. You can, try, you can climb inside freedom of information and start ruining it from inside, we're in a very dangerous place. If you climb inside freedom of culture and start using it against itself, we're in a very dangerous place. It's all about us, actually. Russia can only sort of like dwell on our own weaknesses. So it's a question about us. Do we think our own weaknesses are important? I think they are very important. Uh, they're, they're very good at calling our bluff. You know, I mean, we look at all the energy that our diplomatic force spent after the chemical weapons attack. And I do, I, I keep referring to that because I do a lot of work on Syria. Um, the Wall Street Journal had a great anatomy of that event and sort of how the U.S. government knew within seconds that this was Bashar al-Assad who unleashed sarin gas on 15 people in a capital city. How did they know? They intercepted communications from Moscow to Damascus saying, oh shit, what did you guys just do? Now you've really gone too far. Why isn't that put on YouTube the way that a conversation between one of our State Department officials and another State Department official is put on YouTube or between, you know, an Estonian foreign minister and the EU high representative? I mean, look, it, this sounds aggressive, and I've gotten a lot of resistance when I bring this up at the governmental level here. We can't do that, or, you know, the NSA will never do it. The NSA needs a little bit of good press, I think, and putting, a, putting, an, end, <laughs> putting an end to this sort of controversy, who gassed the, you know, did the rebels gas themselves, or, you know, did, was it Saudi Arabia cooking up this dirty bomb? We just, one, one thing like that would have completely cut Lavrov and Shurkin off at the knees at the UN Security Council, or at least made their jobs a lot harder. All right, let me ask one more question. I could actually go on for quite a while up here. Um, and then I'll turn to the audience. Uh, and it's to the two of you. You name names in the report. And the report, I think, is really good, by the way. I think it's a top, top-notch report. You name some names. I don't want to get into naming names up here. But how do you avoid the charge that anyone who disagrees with you is suspect? that people may actually, th there's probably more agreement about the source of the problem, the Putin regime, 
But the disagreements maybe boil down more to what do we do about it? Yep. And so people who, there are some people who actually don't like sanctions. They actually think they're counterproductive. They think they unite Russians around Putin. So how do you address that charge that you're just painting everybody with a broad brush as suspect who disagrees? No, I, I don't. You don't paint. <laughs> yeah, then, uh, we don't uh, either. Yeah. I mean, well, I don't either. I, I, you know, I would say this, though. All right, um, so I, I, I'm the first one so who's Some of my yeah. best friends are against sanctions, you know. Yeah, no, people can spontaneously alight on a set of policy recommendations that I don't agree with. But when they're making these recommendations and, like I said before, have vested financial interests in Russia that they're not disclosing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, D.C. now seems to be gripped in this sort of um, kind of debate about where do think tanks get their money? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's an excellent question. And, you know, one of the charges we have, I'm going to be very candid with you, we have leveled against us as, oh, in funded by Khodorkovsky. Right. Well, in the report we say, yeah, funded by Khodorkovsky. Right. So where are we wrong? Where's our information wrong? Where's the you know debunking of the evidence that we compiled? Now, we've told you who gives us money. You tell us who gives you money. Right. I mean, I can tell you, you know, um, you and I, w I think everyone here, maybe uh, signed this letter against the so-called Voitso initiative, yep. right? Those of you who don't know, um, there was a, a something that was billed as track two diplomacy on between you know the United States and, and Russia on how to resolve the Ukraine crisis. It was a meeting held in a Finnish island a few months ago. Um, and what was interesting was there were no Ukrainians invited to this meeting. So two, you know, one superpower and one, if you believe the president, regional power, um, negotiating over the fate of a sovereign nation struck us as, as, as particularly galling and, and, and rather rude. So we, we signed this paper saying, you know, we disagree with this. Um, who are the people invited to that meeting? And, you know, how are they getting paid? And, you know, who, what jobs do they have? And where's the money coming from? And, you know, are people now fundraising on the back of pretending that they have the ear of the U.S. government and can actually cut a deal with Putin that will resolve this crisis amicably to everyone's satisfaction? I think these are fair questions to ask. Now, I know it opens us to the charges of McCarthyism and all this stuff, but no. I mean, you know, where is the money? I, I say in Russia, follow the money. So the same thing applies here. I mean, this, uh, if, if I have to say that there's a kind of sub-theme to the work that we're doing, it's, it's this. There is a kernel of truth to, to Putin's game here, which is we have to get our own house in order. Mm -hmm. Europe has to repair what is it has allowed to take take place, which is the influx of dirty rubles, this sort of energy dependency on Russia, which has now hobbled their foreign policy. I mean, they are, the European Union is saying no sanction, no more sanctions, as Russia is sending more material across the border and sending more troops and, and tanks uh, to the border. Well, you know, Putin is sort of sitting there rubbing his hands together saying, you know, look at these guys. They've tied them up in knots because they're, they're desperate to end the sanctions regime completely. I can do whatever I want. So it is, it, this is a kind of a Western self-criticism, first and foremost. Okay. We'll open it up. We'll start with Ariel and then go from there. Please identify yourself and try to keep it brief. Uh, Ariel Cohen, uh, Center for Energy, Natural Resources, and Geopolitics. A terrific report, um, very important descriptive part. Um, I think personally, um, RT um, Rush Today um, is not really uh, a medium. It's not a member of media in our understanding. And if the British authorities ban it, I will be the first one to applaud. And the second question, somebody said the First Amendment would apply to RT. We need a really serious legal examination of that by the appropriate legal counsel in the government. If a government-sponsored uh, tool of foreign policy that is aimed at undermining the existing regime, for lack of a better word, uh, is that something we would ban? W we do ban, if, as far as I know, Al-Manar, the Hezbollah television. We do ban uh, Al-Quds uh, TV. Uh, no, Russians did not invent that. Uh, it, it has been a part of the landscape in the Middle East for at least 30 years. The question is to the esteemed panel and to even more esteemed moderator, is where are we here in this town? Are we paying attention at all 
policy-wise and policy tools-wise, not just at the information component, but at the changing landscape. I attended yesterday a very high-level panel at CSIS with former chiefs of staff of the White House, former head of the CIA, et cetera, et cetera. And people said that this scenario that they discussed was invasion of Estonia. And very senior people said, we should do nothing. And I was shocked. So are we paying attention what's going on at all? Or are we ta paying attention at the health care reform? Um, just yesterday, the Russian Orthodox Church, and I'll finish with that, uh, announced an official test. Who is a Russian? Uh, Google it. The Russian is a person who um, uh, is uh, a believer in Russian Orthodoxy and has no other allegiances ethnically, ethnically, than the Russian nation. So a country where 80% of the population is now has to uh, be a part of this definition that some may say can be compared to definitions of a race or a nation from a different period of the European history uh, from a past century. Uh, what are the implications of that? Is, are we paying attention to that? Um, so. What are the policy tools, both domestically and vis-a-vis -vis Russia in okay. this town? Thank you. I think, uh, yeah. Sorry for being so like uh, A couple rows back, Council. Yep. 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 My name is Alexa Sepchenko. Yeah, it's on. And, and I represent myself. Uh, my question is very simple. Um, you mentioned one of you, may, uh, I'm asking the journalist. You mentioned the Malaysian airplane. Now. Uh, the airplane, which was shot down over um, Ukraine, got twice or three times less coverage than the Malaysian airplane, which disappeared in the Indian Ocean. And this airplane uh, could have been basically a silver bullet, which could get help us to get rid of this vampire. Why did the West, did Western Europe specifically, pr opted not to continue investigating? Why do we still don't know who shot it down? and nobody is indicted. Let's take one more and then we'll come to some responses. Uh, right there and then I promise I'll come to this side. Right, yep. My name is Galima Galiulina and I'm a retired professor from Russia and here I'm a writer and filmmaker. Um, my doctoral dissertation was about freedom of information and I've been writing uh, the dissertation in Soviet uh, Union then continued in uh, post totalitarian Russia. And uh, then I came here, and I spent here five years already. And so I've been comparing always what the landscape here and there for freedom of, infor of information, culture, um, development, uh, and so on. And what I found, um, all my life living in Soviet Union, I've been sure that we're living behind the Iron Curtain, and uh, in my city, Chelyabinsk, I lived even uh, behind the double Iron Curtain because it was a closed city. Uh, but at the same time, I've been able to see, uh, to watch uh, the best American movies. In every small library, even in the, in the villages, it was possible to find American best, best novels uh, written by uh, different uh, American writers, uh, old and uh, modern. And uh, we were able uh, to uh, understand American culture uh, and American politics. And uh, when I came here, I found that um, Americans lived uh, even uh, for more harder Iron Curtain because the uh, general public was not able to watch Soviet movies. And now uh, not too many people are able to watch Russian movies. And uh, Russian literature is not very popular here because it's not translated. So, so your question is? My question is, maybe, Are we missing uh, maybe anything? American journalists, American media specialists uh, living in this relaxation atmosphere of no competition, now not able to fight with people who live in 
uh, the world uh, which was ready to fight for their uh, position uh, and now Russia doing this. So maybe it must be more um, discussion and more uh, efforts to increase, first of all, geopolitical culture of uh, journalists, their geographical culture of journalists. For example, oh, uh, very respectable. Real quick, because we're running low of time. I will finish. Okay. Respectable magazine Times published about elections in Ukraine, uh, and they were uh, journalists writing. Uh, five million people were not able to uh, vote because right. they were surrounded by Russian army. Okay. And they put picture of woman in hijab on yeah. the street of Donetsk. What is this? Okay. Is Got it, it professional? Thank you. Thanks. Who wants to start? Um, I can still remember the questions before I forget. I'll just do it really quickly. Um, uh, so, so Ariel, so actually one of our recommendations about um, RT being, is it part of the media community? So we have two key recommendations regarding this problem. So what I'd firstly like to see, I don't know if this will ever happen, I want to see, I have a vision, Fox and Al Jazeera and the BBC and Deutsche Welle and even Russia Today sitting down together and creating a, ch a charter for international broadcasters saying, we all hate each other, but this is our kind of, this is the behavior we subscribe to. And, you know, you can all hate each other, debate, la la la, we don't do disinformation, we don't lie on purpose. And people who don't subscribe to it, they're kind of out of the club. So I'd like to see peer pressure. The second one that I'd like to see is sort of a transparency international for disinformation. I'd like to see a rating system that we'd be able to slap on different media organizations so we can immediately tell what kind of journalistic standards they have. So Russia Today might look, actually I'm not gonna name Russia Today, a media organization might look like a media organization, it might talk like one, but it'd have a one out of 10 on the rating. Yeah, so straight away, it would kind of be pushed out of the community. I'd much prefer seeing that kind of peer pressure because I think it would discipline us as well rather than top-down censorship. But, you know, I'm a woolly liberal, so, you know. Um, well, you know, I, I, Ariel's much tougher than I am. Yeah, I mean, my tactic with <laughs> Russia today is, first of all, don't legitimate them as a proper news organization. It actually does get under their skin because people who work there, I mean, look, th there's a crisis in media, right? You know, foreign bureaus are being shuttered. You know, Dead Tree Press is kind of collapsing and we don't quite know how to fix these things. So RT comes along with a budget of $300 million, increasing by 40% in the next year, going up and up and up, and offering, what, you know, entry-level stringers 80 grand a year? Not bad, right? But these people eventually want to go on in their careers and do something else. So if you just say, right, we know what you are, and that don't pretend that you're Al Jazeera or, or BBC or Fox News or whatever, it, it does get under their skin. And that also means don't appear on their show. I can't tell you the number of people I know in the expert community particularly when it comes to counterterrorism, yeah, because they love to go on about, you know, the jihadis. Um, don't go on the show. They say, well, you know, better to give a countervailing viewpoint. No, because it doesn't matter what you do, even if it's live broadcast, they're going to spin it, they're going to co-opt you, and you, you, you're granting them an authenticity certificate that they frankly don't deserve. What about the Jamie Kirchick scenario? That was a great Probably. thing, but how, you know, everybody's going to go on RT and, and say, you know, I denounce you for being, uh, you know, a propaganda. It's just after a while, that gets quite prosaic. I mean, Jamie, that was a match you can only light once, I think. He and probably won't Jamie. be invited back. And he's not going to uh, be no. invited back. Um, to the point, I want to just answer the question about MH17. Uh, yeah, actually, this is something that, that, that bothers me a lot. Th this was a huge, I, I mean, it's not true that the media was silent on this. I mean, I, I practically lived in MSNBC studios for two days straight doing nothing but MH17, but um, it's kind of disappeared from the headlines. Uh, the fact that, you know, there hasn't been an investigation, well, there, there's sort of a pseudo investigation, but let's be honest, that crash site was contaminated within 15 mm. minutes and you know, separatists block people from coming in. You're never gonna get a, a credible investigation given the time that's gone on. Um, I would say this though, you know, look at what they said. Their response, again, there was not a single narrative or account for what happened. The first thing was, this was the Ukrainians aiming at Putin's presidential plane which flew over the same s the sky in the same time. Nonsense, that was debunked. Then it was, oh, two Sukhoi 25s by the Ukrainian uh, Air Force tracked the plane and shot it down. Doesn't matter that Sukhoi 25s have an altitude ceiling 10,000 feet below that of MH17 where it was flying. Then they said actually that one of the Sukhoi 25s was hovering around the crash site. Sukhoi 25s don't hover because if they, they have a stall speed of like 300 miles an hour. So they would have fallen out of the sky too. So again, but these kinds of things, they're so transparently ridiculous. 
You but don't there, need there was, specialized. Of course, was the one the plane was full of corpses. Ex and yeah, Strelkov himself said yes. They got to their their site and and they found that the, all the blood had been sort of taken out of the body. But here's by the way, taken straight from the Sherlock episode. There you go. Very and, nice and well but, but but the most interesting thing to us, and we, we actually devoted a lot of time to this story because separatist media initially claimed credit for doing this. Right? They said we got another Ukrainian cargo jet. And then they said, whoops, I mean, cat's out of the bag. But I if you go to Russian state-controlled media to this day, you will see articles still posted where the separatists are claiming credit for this. So, you know, the evidence is out there. It's, it, you, it, you don't need to do, you know, sort of covert ops. It, I don't think it's silent. Yeah. It's just, it's, look, we're now we're at war in Iraq and Syria, probably tomorrow in Poland, who knows? I mean, so like everyone's focus is is changed. There, are, there are there's a lot of different nodes of focus. I mean, it it certainly bothers me as one who spends all of my time focusing on that area. That when I turn on CNN at night, there's absolutely nothing on there. Maybe five minutes about what's going on in eastern Ukraine. Yes, that bothers me absolutely. But I do think that th there is a certain problem with the fact that people. People in the journalistic community and people in the expert community have gone for a long time where the money is, where the jobs are, and where the interest is. And for a long time, that's been not Eastern Europe. A lot of people still do not know how to cover, how to write about, how to deal with what's going on in Eastern Europe. And I think that shows in the coverage. I would just say one thing, and then we'll take another round. Um, the last round of sanctions would not have happened had the airline had not been shot down. Yeah. I, I think there is a tendency in the West to pat ourselves on the back too much because we passed that round of sanctions. The EU was not going to go ahead, in my view at least, with another round if it hadn't been for the tragedy of the 298 people. Um, so whether there was insufficient attention or not, at least that did trigger uh, a, a strong reaction. But I underscore the word reaction. And, and the Western policy has been far too reactive and slow instead of being preemptive and preventive and trying to block Putin from, from the aggression. And just one tidbit real quick. I believe it yes. was Bellingcat who just did a, mm -hmm. a sort of investigation about MH17, and they went through and geolocated absolutely everything. Uh, it's a report that's online. It's very well done. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend you go look that up. All right. Uh, back there, gentleman with his hand up, and David and then over there. And I always see you got in the back. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Seth Ivanovitz. I'm just representing myself. Um, quick question. Uh, the uh, key uh, countries, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the Baltic states, attempted to uh, put together a Russian network which would counteract some of the issues that you're talking about, and it failed miserably. Evidently, a lot of them couldn't find the money, and some of them specifically um, decided for various reasons to go at the, their themselves. I believe Estonia is just doing, working with RFE. What do you take from this, uh, uh, this situation where the pe key people who are enemy number one, having watched RT, can't even put together a Russian network which would counteract this, and how do you interpret that? Okay, David. Well, same lines. I, I'm David Ensor, director of Voice of America. And uh, my question for you is, what should we do? What should Voice of America, what should Radio Free Europe, what should BBC Russian do now? Thank you. Thank you for the succinctness of that question. <laughs> <laughs> we like them Hi. short. Yeah. Peter Krivosich, CSIF. Uh, two short questions. First, when did uh, the Russian, you, you identified, um, Richard, uh, sorry for getting here, Peter, um, uh, you identified the Russian military using information war early on. Was that the second Chechen conflict that you see as the starting point or earlier? Um, what are the major turning points in the Russian state's co-opting of the news media? And um, further, kind of along the same lines as the Voice of America, what uh, are there any prospects for moderate or non-state news media penetration in Russia at this point? Uh, could, a, could a Russian blogger who's not with the state get anything off the ground, or is he going to be co-opted immediately? Thank you. And then I saw a hand in the back. I'm also conscious of the time, um, so we'll take that one. Hold on for a, for a mic. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, thank you, Chris. Asta Benonis with the Lithuanian American Community Incorporated Grassroots Membership Organization. Um, I'm uh, glad to see David here, and my question follows up on the, pre the three previous ones. RFE has gotten surge. RFERL has gotten surge money to do this 30 uh, 30 minute a day generic Russian language program targeted to the Russian minorities in their broadcast area. 
So have any of you listened to that program yet? It's been on about a month, I think, or five weeks. I've been on it. And what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. I didn't listen to it, though. I mean, I wouldn't listen to it. Yes. I believe that program was blocked. But anyway, go ahead. I'm yeah. Please. Yeah. All right, you got um, four questions. Okay, these are all my, mainly in my parish because I'm actually a TV producer and I'm very, very obsessed with these questions. Um, very quickly about the military stuff. Yep. So, look, from the 1990s, you have eccentrics like Igor Panarin talking about the Fourth World War being the information war. Practically, when the serious guys start writing about it, you know, the, the, the Genstab guys, um, they start writing about it after Orange Revolution 2004. They start writing about it a hell of a lot more after, after Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. Uh, during Georgia, they're already using it against Akashvili, which can be seen as one huge reflective control sort of operation and complete double bind on Saakashvili. But um, about doing it west and from 2008, uh, that's really when, when the big guys start writing about it. But it's in the air already in the mid-90s. I mean, asymmetric war goes back to Soviet times. Yeah. A lot of these techniques, look, a lot of these techniques, they're part of any country's covert sort of like operation. What Russia has done is taken the covert and made it overt. They've taken what, like a couple of like, you know, we do this as well, the West does it as well, but it's their tiny little things that are kind of like some ridiculous Twitter project in Cuba or something. Uh, Operation Mockingbird in the 50s. It's, you know, the techniques are old. What Russia has done is focus them and ramp them up to make them the kind of. And, um, and can yeah. I just add in, those military doctrines are out there. Mm. You can look them up, you can read them. The military doctrine mm. from 2010, go look up all of uh, General Gerasimov's speeches. He says in 2010 and 2012 exactly what happened in Crimea, exactly what's happening in Donbass right now. It's out there. They're very, very clear about it, but we're not paying attention. No, no, they're clear about it. One also has to be careful because they like to write about that. That doesn't mean, you know, that there's a Russian, there's a Soviet culture of like doing a lot of daklade. You know, <laughs> they, they love that. When it comes <laughs> down, it's like, it's basically Putin and Gromov and a couple of other people going, hey, what do we do? Um, but um, so we have to be careful with the theory stuff as well. The Baltic stuff. So I've just been to Riga and Estonia. Um, they're actually, ha they haven't abandoned the idea. They're, they're thinking of different ways of making it happen. They're thinking about how to collate material, how they take like, the news from Dodge, something from RFB, programming from Moldova to kind of create this sort of hodgepodge of something. Um, uh, in terms of response, so now I worked inside of Russian TV in the mid noughties and I saw this Frankenstein growing. Um, we have to understand what they're very good at. Uh, we have to rid ourselves of a couple of 20th century illusions. So firstly, they have perfected the art of mixing entertainment and authoritarianism, of uh, mixing indoctrination and Jerry Springer. I mean, they make incredibly entertaining programs which are deeply politically insidious at the same time. Also, we, we have to slightly understand that information isn't going to be enough. You do get information in Russia. You certainly get information in Estonia. The fact is Russian uh, media is so insidious in its emotional um, uh, manipulation that it kind of overrides the information. It doesn't matter that the information is out there, they do much stronger narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, by using really a bunch of psychological and emotional techniques which are actually closer to the way a sect works rather than an information agency. We can get into how they do that in a more detailed conversation, maybe next time. Um, but they have one Achilles heel. They have one massive Achilles heel. And when I was working on Russian TV, I and a few other people, we started making programs for an entertainment channel about the real lives, really gritty documentary stuff about the real lives of kids getting beaten up by cops, by people having their business taken away. These were emotionally engaging films about normal people having a horrible time from the state. The ratings were really, really high. And it was a med better thaw, it was kind of like a blind eye was turned, then boom, it was off. Channel One, which is the main propagandist channel, ran a really good documentary style drama about life in a Russian school. Huge ratings, became cult taken off there, too edgy. Kostya Ernst talks about this all the time. He knows this is his Achilles heel. They can do the simulacra of democracy. They can't get into the real meat of society. So apart from information, we have to start making shows. This is really the TV producer rather than the analyst and me talking that will be able to engage uh, with serious social issues in an entertaining way. The Americans don't know how to do this. The British are brilliant at this. So we have something called a genre called, no, you just don't well. do it. You just do talent shows. Uh, for example, we have a, we had a, we, we have, population. For, for, for example, we had a, a reality show called uh, Make Bradford British. So Bradford is a very divided town in northern Britain where we have a lot of race riots. So we took, um, ch Channel 4 made this, um, sort of uh, an Islamist, Quick question. Okay, an Islamist, a skinhead, uh, a couple of other races, put them in a house together like Big Brother and got them to sort out their problems. Oh, oh. It, was, it went really well and it, you know, I want to do sort of like Narva House or something or make Kharkiv uh, Ukrainian. So we have to get into <laughs> 
uh, we have to get into telling these. That's the one thing that the Russian propaganda can't do because it's always going to be simulacra because the whole society is like that. Sorry, it's just my pet hobby. That yes, <laughs> thank you. I actually think um, you know the Ukrainians are quite pathfinding in this respect, right? Um, you know, we, we talk about Ukraine, and this is something we have to sort of stop doing ourselves. Um, Ukraine is not this sort of battleground between West and East. It is a country with its own culture, its own people, its own agency, its own sovereignty. And civil society in Ukraine has discovered, look, we can broadcast in Russian and English about events taking place in this country. We can criticize the government. We can go after corrupt oligarchs who are enthralled to Moscow and doing all kinds of nefarious deals with European companies and European governments. Um, for instance, TV Gromotsky, uh, which is founded by Mustafa Nayam, who was an anti-corruption crusader, sort of like the Navalny of Ukraine, who's now gone into parliament, somewhat controversially. Mm -hmm. They just launched an English language Sunday sort of meet the press style chat show, broadcast on the internet. Um, the first guest that they had was Timothy Snyder, who has essentially become the historian laureate of Ukraine, even though he's American. Uh, it's actually compelling TV. Um, there is no, no reason why Ukraine can't actually be the cockpit for this sort of experiment in reaching Russian-speaking audiences. Mm -hmm. And again, remember, I mean, get going back to first principles, why did Putin decide he wanted Crimea? Why is he trying to, to overthrow this government or destabilize Ukraine? Well, it goes back to 2004, the Orange Revolution. That, to him, was a sign of things to come in Moscow. If it can happen in Kiev, it will happen here, never, never, ever. So if Ukraine succeeds as a country with sort of open society, democracy, rule of law, eradicating corruption, which, I mean, I interviewed the chief of staff of Petro Poroshenko, and he said he was the former head of uh, Ukraine Microsoft, so Western educator, worked for Western companies. He says, my favorite law invented in by, by you know, all mankind is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which we have here, because that it prevents people and companies from going abroad and paying bribes. He said, if we had that in Ukraine, you could hoover up corruption you know, in five to 10 years. Um, I think these are the things we need to encourage. And you know, like everyone's sort of in, in questing for institutions and new groups and trying to raise money to do things that actually already exist. It's just seizing upon some of these talents and some of these assets and saying, oh, hey, have you seen this? And maybe invest a little more in them. I, again, watch Ukraine, because U Ukrainian civil society, that is the heartbeat of the Euromaidan revolution. And it's something that hasn't gone away just because Yanukovych has been overthrown. Um, and yeah, I mean, they can reach the Baltics. They can reach the Russian-speaking diaspora. Well, and I'll add to that. I mean, a lot of the journalists in Russia who had been working for places like RIA Novosti or had been working for uh, magazines or for online sites that have now sort of been taken over or, or co-opted, they have now actually made a conscious decision to move to Ukraine because they feel as though that's a place that they can actually work. They can work for Fromatsky TV, that they can work for Stephen Lobachina, they can work for all of these new upstart uh, media organizations that are actually doing serious work. And a lot of them do feel as though they can do the investigative things that need to be done from Ukraine. And Ukraine gives them a platform and they're doing it in the Russian language. And it is uh, reaching a Russian audience. Um, I was in London at a conference recently and met uh, Yevhen Fedchenko, the head of stopfake.org. And he said, it's a website that's devoted to sort of exposing lies in, in the Russian media and lies about Ukraine. And he said, you know where one third of our audience comes from? From Russia. There are people in Russia who want to have that kind of information. There are still a few open portals. It's getting harder, it's getting smaller. And I think to your blogger's question, they've now set up the laws in such a way that it's going to be nearly impossible for anyone to be a blogger with it with any kind of serious following. Anything over 3,000 uh, hits a day, you're going to have to register as a member of the media. Um, but there are ways around that. You can do, say, listservs. You can uh, do email blasts. There are certain ways that people can get around them, and they're being very creative about it. But the atmosphere, I think, is only going to get tougher as time goes on. Let me close with the uh, last question. Um, quick answers from each of you you would. Um, Vladimir Putin disappears tomorrow. Gone. Is this all systemic and therefore it's not going to change just because Putin isn't there? Does it depend on how he disappears? Um, is this not dependent on just him? I think it's absolutely not just dependent on him. Um, you know, the question of will there be a coup and if so, who will be in charge of it and when will it happen? Um, 
Professor Mark Galliotti, who's a friend of, of ours and very insightful nine months in Moscow, I asked him this question. He said, look, um, in order to do that, if, they, if there was a conscious decision taken on the part of sort of inner circles in the Kremlin to replace Putin, uh, it wouldn't be now, and it would actually be a long-term project because you have to line up you know, the heads of the five families, so to speak, the Siloviki, the business community, the business elites. I mean, one of the things Putin did immediately when sanctions started to be passed was to say, okay, um, anybody in the oligarchic community or the sort of business establishment who even thinks about being disloyal or jumping ship, I'm going to cut your head off. And Yevtushenko's arrest yeah. was, a, uh, to me, I mean, this had little to do actually with Sechin and all these things. This was sort of a scarecrow, sort of a classic Stalinist measure. Yeah, even no, even people who, are, yeah, even people who are loyal to me are subject to being sort of disgraced, discredited, having their assets taken, and being thrown in jail. Um, so I think he's very, again, adroitly co-opted that group. Um, but look, I, you know, I, I don't think he's going to be replaced. I think he's going to stay in power as long as he can. And again, my, my concern is, I mean, we keep hearing all these things like, well, if the Russian economy starts to teeter, then something will happen. And if oil drops below $100 a barrel, it used to be, that's it for Putin. Well, now it's $80 a barrel and he's still in power. I mean, uh, you know, how much money does he have in reserve? You know, I don't think Anders Asplund could answer this question. How much money does Putin have stashed away, a rainy day fund, in case he wants to invade another European country and has to withstand sanctions? I think it's quite a lot, actually. And I see him preparing his population Absolutely. for a kind of, you know, soft Stalingrad against the West. You know, we're now at war with the West, and we need to kind of. And by the way, it's not nowhere near as bad as it was in the 90s. I mean, people can still eat. You know, this is not austerity <laughs> the way Russians know austerity. So I think there's some staying power here, and you know, I, I don't see anything sort of systemically changing soon. I I'll agree, and I think that to to pick up on your last point, I think one of the things Putin has actually done reasonably successfully in part through his use of the media is to try and change the social compact I think he, he had built with the Russian people where beforehand it was all right the 1990s have been a terrible time for you you have all of these economic problems what I'm going to give you is stability and an increased uh, level of living and in return you let me do as I please and I think the new deal he's trying to make with the Russian people is essentially Look, you're going to have to suffer a little bit, just like your grandparents did during World War II, or the Great Patriotic War, as it is sometimes known. But what I'm going to give you in return is, is a Russia that is back in its proper place in the world, one that people respect, one that they fear, and one that is considered on an equal footing. So if he's successful at that, and I think if you look at the polling data, he has been, you know, of course, something could always happen to him. Uh, people do die. That happens. Um, but It does. It does. I'm, I'm just putting that out that there. You know, you, you, you never know. We have but that in the report, actually. Especially people, in the UK die. if they it's drink tea or, you know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, going to disagree with you. Let's not get um, there. Um, the, the Russia has a structural problem with what we all know as preemnik. That's why we always have an operatse preemnik. Yeah. What who is going to be the heir? It's a structural problem. Ev virtually this, they haven't. Oh, I can barely talk. They haven't been able to systematize the idea of how the air comes along. They haven't managed it. And Unlike Putin the Chinese, pointed this therefore, out last week. Therefore, when Putin goes, I think we'll see a major spiritualbase because it's systemic. They have no systemic way of choosing the next person. So, no, I, I'm actually going to disagree. I think um, th th I'm not saying things will get better, but I actually think it will be very, very turbulent. Okay. Well, let me first thank the NED and Institute of Modern Russia for putting this event together. Um, a particular thanks to Peter and Michael for a, a great report, but also a real special thanks to Hannah for rounding out what I thought was a very interesting, informative, and entertaining panel. And thanks to and all to of you, you for coming. And to you for, for moderating Thank that. Thank you very much. Thank you.